Hello, and uh, welcome. Uh, I am joined here with my co-host, the one and only Dr. Vibe. How you doing, Dr. Vibe? Blessed, highly favored, magnet for miracles, and a solution to someone's problem. We have a great show for you guys tonight. We have heavyweights here. And, you know, it's it's not every day that you get such an illustrious um, panel of uh, really intelligent people. And I am just so happy to be here with you and joined here by, of course, Dr. Vibe. And we are going to have a great discussion tonight. Um, what I'm going to do, you're going to hear in a second. I'm sorry. You're going to hear some uh, we have there we go. heavyweights. My bad. Uh, you can you you heard me a little bit um, the reverb right there, but anyway. So um, tonight we have a very special um, conversation that we're going to have, and it's something that I've been wanting to do for a long time because uh, there's a lot of conversation about the role of um, the black church in our community uh, and. Christianity as a whole, does it hinder us at all when it comes to black empowerment? And I have my thoughts, you know, of how I, what I think, but I, I, I needed to get a super team together so we can have this conversation. So uh, I'm going to start off by um, let's introduce our panel. And uh, we have one more gentleman that's going to be joining us uh, very soon. So uh, I'm gonna start off with Brother Melvin. How are you doing, Melvin? Um, and I, I want people. I want you to give a little bit of background about who you are. Okay, I'm great, Brother Kente, and and your and your co-host, uh, my mentor, Dr. Vibe. And it's great to be here with the other brothers, uh, Brother Taylor, and Brother Crowley. I am uh, Melvin Lars. I host a video cast called the Nobody Asked Me Guy Show, and we talk about various topics. I'm a retired high school principal. Uh, writer, poet, we do various things, and uh, we do a lot of activism. I'm a quote activist, uh, unquote, and I'm also a, uh, a an ordained minister. Uh, quite honest, uh, quite effectively in the Kojic Church and in the CME Church. So uh, it, it's interesting to to be a part of this of this uh, broadcast, and uh, just waiting to uh, to get things started, and just excited about being here with you and Dr. Vibe and the other brothers. R real quick, too, as just as a side note, as far as you said, the Kojic Church, um, I went to junior high at West Angeles Christian Academy. West Angeles right. being, you know, uh, you know, uh, one of the biggest Kojic Church out there. And uh, so there you go. So we have a little. I grew up Baptist, though, but that's the uh, yeah. junior high I went to. All right, okay. so uh, Taylor, Brother Taylor, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm pretty much a lay person, you know. I'm a, I'm a, a daddy, a father, a husband. Um, I work in public service, and I am a Bible enthusiast, if you will. Um, I grew up in the AME church um, in my younger years as a child. And then as an adult, I had uh, several years in the Pentecostal church. Um, I never really clung to any denomination. I just started off as just going to church. Um, and then I started reading the Bible. And before I could finish it, I couldn't go to church anymore. Mm. So I've kind of been like a, mm. this flaming bible enthusiast now it's it's, it's weird I, I don't i'm so i'm not really comfortable with being classified as a christian a lot of times um i like to define that all right of course when the conversation is short okay i'm a christian right but if we really get in the conversation i really i don't i'm kind of funny about that title and um i said i'm very interested in philosophical and theological conversations and um been married for a whole lot of years so it just takes me it feels like it takes me out of the loop of just the common and regular things you know the fun things if you will but yeah that's pretty much me in a nutshell 
All right, all right. Um, and uh, Dre, no, you did not miss it. We're just starting now. Uh, he was asking, did he miss it? Um, all right, so this next brother, I, I, I purposely uh, saved him for last. Uh, he's kind of um, new to our family, um, but um, I'm a big fan of, of his work. I love watching his show uh, every week, uh, thanks to Angela, who put me up on this brother right here, Brother Andrew Crawley. Tell us a little bit about yourself, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks all again for having me. My name is Andrew Crawley here in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, and uh, I am a uh, Christian. I've been a Christian leader for some time now. I actually set out because um, I kind of admire what uh, Brother Taylor was saying because of the line of work that I've been talking about. I'm really set out to kind of challenge the church and its ecclesiology to, to stop just preaching Bible and actually execute Bible. Uh, and so because of that, we see uh, with my line of work, we see that there are two different worlds between what we call the church, church people, and actual, you know, the biblical remnant. It executes different. Its ideals are a lot different. And organic Christianity is another different world that most Christians never get to experience. And so, therefore, it lies the confidence or the lack thereof of what we call Christianity nowadays. So that's been my line of work for now. I'm nine years coming up on a decade where I've actually been working on that. I kind of got in trouble because I've broken some rules in what we would call traditional institutional church. And therein lies the uh, problem, a lot of things that we saw. And so now I'm, I'm out to get in the boat of leaders, try to help enlighten um, and also mentor Christian leaders. Uh, and it's across denominational board, you know, 90% of what we call church, regardless of denomination, they execute off a chassis that is not designed uh, to, to bring organic Christianity to the forefront. So that's kind of just a little bit about me and my line of work. All right. All right, man. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And I'm looking forward to getting everybody's thoughts. Now, just to let you know, this is the all male panel. Next week at the same time, we have an all uh, ladies panel um, w with, uh, you know, Dr. Tachi is going to be on. Shannon's going to be on. Uh, of course, Angie is going to be on as well as uh, I know I'm leaving somebody out. Uh, dang, I'm getting old. Uh, L.A. <laughs> Wade is going to be on as well. I hope she's not there to uh, shoot yes, me. Uh, so uh, that's going to be great as well. Um, if you don't mind, Dr. Vibe, I, I'd like to start off here. Um, I noticed that as a young black male, uh, when I was a young black male, um, you still are. <laughs> um, there is, there seems to be a point where young black men, a lot of them go away from the church. Like we might've been, we might've grew up in the church. Um, you know, like me, I went to church like four times a week. I went to a religious junior high school. My grandfather is a min was a minister. Um, my mother, you know, was very, is very, even today steeped in the church. But, you know, when I became a teenager, I, I strayed away from the church heavy. Not that I became a atheist or didn't believe, but, you know, I moved away from the church. Right. And I noticed that a lot of us are black males and uh, specifically because we're talking about the black community that tends to happen where we get away from the church. And so the first question I kind of want to start off with, uh, I'll start off with you, Melvin. Um, why do you think that a lot of black males, when they get to, you know, in their teens, feel like there's nothing for them at the in the black church? Well, great question. Hypocrisy. Allow me to start there. Uh, because my, my, my feelings uh, were pretty much the same, uh, remain pretty much the same as I listened to Brother Taylor and uh, Brother Crowley introduce themselves. I wrestle even to this day uh, with the fact of the, quote, traditional church, with things that we teach people about the Bible, the standards that we try to hold people to, and that kind of thing. So, you know, just as we start the conversation, I'd have to say hypocrisy because you know, you see a lot of things happening. You see a lot of things occurring. Uh, I did not grow up in the house with a minister, but I grew up uh, like probably most of us uh, in a house where you were pretty much required uh, to attend church, uh, Bible study if they had that, or BTU, youth training or whatever they had, Sunday school, etc. And you would hear all of these 
uh, sermons and all these uh, 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 well wishes and well to do, but you see the total opposite in action. So I just feel very, very strongly with your question is that men are not as emotional, I don't think, as women, to be very honest with you. So mm -hmm. whereas, and I know you didn't ask me about the women, but our women mm -hmm. tend to hinge more on emotion. And uh, men kind of see the reality. And, and I often say, and I'll be honest with you, uh, my wife is a pastor, quite honestly. Oh, wow. In the, uh, yeah, in the CME church. And it, I grew up Baptist as well. You know, they don't believe in women preachers in the, in the Baptist church. Mm -hmm. Kojic uh, is pretty much the same. They're kind of changing. But I had to go there to simply say this. I tell my wife all of the time is that just your court. I said, you know what? She said, well, you know, you got to help me get more men in the church. You got to help me get more men in the church. And I say to my wife all the time is that men are not going to go to church in droves. Because first of all, uh, when you're on the street chasing the same woman mm -hmm. and somebody's calling you pastor and you're showing up every Sunday, uh, talking about the ears of the devil, no man, no man is trying to hear you. Or when you're bumping into the same guy at the liquor store, and he's preaching hell's hell fire and brimstone, no man is trying to hear you. And and that just you know two of the two of the things that that uh, you know I, I touch upon. But uh, I just there's so much hypocrisy uh, in what we call Christianity, until men, in my opinion, just just kind of uh, deal with with uh, less emotion and more of what we read and what we see. And I want to open that same question to the rest of the panel. Anybody jump in? Uh, uh, do you want to go, Taylor? Or Andrew or Taylor? I, I, I thought Taylor was going to say something. I will. Um, I feel like um, I, th I feel like it has a lot to do with um, irrelevance. You know, um, so much of the sermons and the suggestions and the exhortations a lot of times it's it's either irrelevant or it's like unrealistically catering to um, something that's just it's either not there or you know it's told I guess it, it leans towards uh, what brother Casey was saying also you know whereas a lot of things in church happens from an emotional standpoint you know so you know, and, and I guess when I say that, I'm speaking more from a personal uh, point of view because I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I've never, I've, uh, I've held like a, what do you call it? Like I was a kind of like a, on the, what do you say, like a minister's board, but I've never been like in leadership in a church. So I wouldn't feel comfortable saying what I thought it was for others. So I have to say just what it was for me. And it was just irrelevance, you know, nothing everything that I was experiencing in real life from relationships to anger, to sex, to drugs, to school, to work and jobs, everything, you know, if there were any exhortations or suggestions or guidance from the church, it was just way off, you know, and it just deemed itself useless and probably not even real. Mm. And I, was, I sat in a place like that for a few years. A, a lot of them, I would say probably about five or six years or so. But I think it's just a relevance a lot of times, in my opinion. Hmm. Brother Andrew? Yeah, I'll say, and to go along with the answers, that um, I definitely say that uh, one of the reasons is because the church uh, has taken on the, the context of the world or surrounding society around it. And just like society has psychologically and right now is psychologically castrating the man. So now the church is spiritually castrating the man. And so one reason why we have 70% of the overall at church at large is made up of women. And we keep empowering doctrines and things for that to continue. The male seems like he has not only no place and like when he says relevance, it makes totally sense. And when uh, my brother uh, Casey's talked about, um, it being hypocrisy because it truly is because the Bible that we say we read if we really understood first of all what church is for we would then understand that that ministry wasn't God's first choice you know a lot of times we we have to be reminded and a lot of times we're not reminded that we worship ministry but ministry wasn't God's first choice it, it's actually ministry is actually only a redemptive concept why because the family structure was God's first choice so if we understand God's uh, choice order for family the reason why we, we have become hypocritical 
is because we are now enforcing doctrines and, and, and now patting things on the back that castrates the male. So that's a male is not going to go where he's castrated or feel that, you know, he don't have any relevance because God designed us in our interior to be relevant and to be needed. If that makes sense. Hopefully that does. makes makes great sense. Um, and purposely um, let, <clears throat> excuse me, left it to you, Dr. Vibe, um, from your point of view, um, I don't know. You know, I, I'm not we haven't had this conversation before. So, I, you know, I'm, we're going to be learning. But um, when you, you know, became a teenager, a young man, um, I, I, I would l really love to speak to you. Like, did you grow up in a uh, Christian household and did you stay or? OK, so you know, if you bring up a very interesting question, I think adding on to what the gentleman was saying, one of the things I think is challenging for a lot of young black men is, first of all, are there any older black men that they know are going to church? Right. Right. Yes. Because for me. If, not, if they're not seeing any older black, like, and if they, if they do have a father, is that father going to church? When I was younger, my dad told me to go to church, but he didn't go himself. <laughs> so I'm going like, why, why is this man telling me to go to church? And he ain't even going. <laughs> so I think there is a part there. I think another part too is, young men will say you know what why am i going to church it's no different than the world and some of the churches some of the things that That's they're good. glorifying That's are no good. different than what they're, what they're seeing on the streets yes so yes they, they always have this thing the church and the world and in some churches the church and the world are the same thing right right, right. You're like so the same right. people you see in the club on Saturday, you'll see in the church on Sunday. <laughs> so, exactly. And, right. and these young brothers are not, they're smart. Right. They're knowing, they know, they know the game. They know what's going on. So they're saying, hey, I'm not seeing any older mentors in the church. Plus what they're saying there and what they're, uh, you know, this, what's, I, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but I'll get it before we finish up tonight. But the, what, what, you know, riches and i don't know there's a type of preaching i can't remember prosperity prosperity yeah, that's it. prosperity ministries right Man. so all these prosperity images are going like it's easier for me to get prosperity out on the street than it is in the church so why am i going to church right right now, now i'll share with you guys one of the main reasons why i strayed away from the church um, as I, as I said at the beginning, I was, you know, I went to church four times a week. I was part of this thing and that thing. Um, don't, don't you guys worry. I wasn't, uh, I was in the choir when I was a little kid, but, uh, when I realized how bad my voice was, I got out of the choir. So don't worry about that. Those who've seen, heard me sing. Um, but what happened was our church, um, there was an earthquake, right? And it damaged our sanctuary. And we had this minister, this young minister who had came in and he was like, you know, like all the young kids, like the kids of the church, like loved him because he he was like this great pastor. He was, you know, vibrant and he was doing things at our church and all of this stuff. And then an earthquake came. And our church went through a lot like we couldn't even be in our own sanctuary. We were I mean, we had that we were like vagabonds. We had we were in a. Um, in a uh, funeral home, right? Having church. We were in a Jewish synagogue, right? Cause during that time there was this whole big thing about black churches connecting with Jewish synagogues. I don't know if you remember that, like in the nineties, they, they were really pushing that thing. And then there was a lot of uh, churches that were sister churches to synagogues. Right. And so this one J Jewish synagogue would allow us to have church there. So our church was going through a lot. And then what happened was our minister got a better deal in another state and kind of left us high and dry. And I remember as a teenager going, wait a minute, like we really needed, you know, like, I mean, it's one thing to leave us when we're whole. And he kind of, he left us when we were, we really needed that leadership. And it really set our church back quite a bit. And I remember as a kid, that really messed me up. Cause it was like, it, it made me feel like, you know, like, is it about money? Is it about, you know, um, you know, maybe I, I saw it wrong. Maybe as a kid, who knows? 
maybe I didn't understand the complexities of what he was going through or whatever. But the only thing I saw it was our church was, you know, really needed him during that period of time. And when it got hard, he left. And that really rubbed me the wrong way. And it really made me, I mean, I never doubted God or anything like that, but it made me, you know, as a young man kind of question, you know, what is this about and stuff like that. Now, that was, you know, that was part of it. And then, you know, you know, I got older. I started chasing girls, that kind of stuff, too. So I ain't going to act like that was the only reason why I, you know, did it. <laughs> and there's a reason why I'm bringing this up, because we're talking about black empowerment, right? And the reason why I'm bringing that up specifically, and we're going to do that with the ladies, too, but in a, di- a slightly different way next week, is the males are the warrior class, Right. And especially when you're young, right? If something breaks off, the young men, ha- you know, need to be there to fight, right? And so our warrior class leaves the church when they're when they're young, for the most part, right? Don't get me wrong; some people do they stay in the church and all of that kind of stuff. So my th- my question to you is. Do you think that that aspect of our warrior class, our young men, black males, straying away from the church because they don't find that there's something for them there, do you think that that um, hurts our church? And we're talking about specifically the black church. Um, Do you feel like that um, hurts our church because, you know, that's a whole group of men that we, you know, we need to cultivate at, you know, not wait till they 70, you know, <laughs> when they come back to the church, but like get them when they're young and and they still have that, that young fire. So I, I want you to talk about that, Andrew, uh, like, and then also some solutions too. like, what can we do to speak to young black males, you know, the black church? Well, first of all, one of the, Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You're good. The, the screen was good. Okay. Okay. Um, my screen had a lag in it, so I didn't want to feel sound like I was cutting anybody off. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, one of the things is to, one of the things that we have to look at is we have to look at the overall workings of what we call church. Because for any human, I know we're talking about the males, but even for the females too, if ever you have a place that's supposed to mature you, but, but that place lack giving you an opportunity for freedom of expression, Mm-hmm. You're going to come to a point where now you're just reduced to sitting down being a spectator of a presentation. And if that presentation isn't directly either appealing to you or to get you to engage, then a lot of times you'll check out. And so not only with the males, that's with the females for one. So I've, because, you know, normally we reduce church down to a presentation where you hear a couple, I call it the two to one. You come to church every Sunday and do the same thing. You get two songs, two offerings, and one sermon, and then you go home. You know what I'm saying? And so one of the things that we'll find is that if we get to the place to where we, like the scriptures let us know in Corinthians, to where we can actually have freedom of expression, one of the things that it would afford is the opportunity to, for, to, for one, to not be bored and dry. And I'm not advocating doing whatever it takes to be fun because I'm not talking about bringing sin and stuff in. I'm just talking about what the early church did and what people do and what Jesus even did with the disciples. So I think one of the biggest things we need to do for the males is first of all, like you said, uh, Dr. Vibe hit it off pretty much when he's talked about, if you don't see any older males there, meaning guess what? Key word, I don't see anyone that I can relate to that's, that could, that is a worthy example for me. And that's one of the things, first of all, we have to exemplify that in our leadership, and that's harder because 70 percent of the church is made up of females so a strong feminist push have, have kind of overtaken the church like it has our society now in this me too movement that's one thing about that's that the reason why the black males are suffering that i was saying and i'll leave it you know for someone else to piggyback mm. oh this uh this is interesting too uh, stephanie says a lot of men are brought to, brought to christ through their women I saw one of the comments there, someone saying that, uh, that it, to, in 10 to 20 years, there'll be no black men in the church. I'd like to know what they're, yes, I just like know why. So hopefully they'll follow up with that comment. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things, if we're looking solution-based, as I try to do as much as possible, the church has to go 
where these people are at and they have to ask them what can we help you with they can't just sit up there and expect them to flock to them they have to there's an old song called taking it to the streets they have to take it to the streets they have to go where these young people at and develop a relationship get them to know like and trust them then you can move forward you have to have that no like and trust factor with the young people they've got more distractions so much stuff going on so you have to get into their for lack of it into their world and invest some time into it so i, I think that's one of the, one of the, one of the potential solutions there and mm -hmm. the funny thing is you know, how many I'm uh, sorry. And, uh, it's interesting how many churches out there have and most churches when you have a a men's leadership team Again, most of them are older men. And every every success needs a successor. So I'm concerned for a lot of churches out there that even have men in there, do they have a succession plan to get younger men in there? Mm -hmm. They're just sitting there and just and you know, it's and, and just it's just gonna slowly but surely they're gonna die off. And maybe that's why the comment came up within 10 to 20 years, you're not going to see any black men at church because the ones that are there are old and going to die. <laughs> right. Good. But you, you know, you know, guys, if, 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 if I might share, because if I can segue off what you brothers are saying, as can tell you with asking the question, one of the sad things is we don't embrace the young men that come into the church. You know, every, everybody wants to be a dictator and everybody wants to say, you know, well, you need to, learn from your elders well if the elder and you guys have already saying it if the elder is not embracing you and he's not instructing you but most of the things you hear from them is to be obedient one can be obedient and still be given structure and that's that's a sad thing that happens within our churches secondly uh, in many churches that i see you know people boast about having children's church mm -hmm. so now what what, what do you have you have children with, you know, young teenagers, uh, young men, one or two young women in their 20s, whatever, instructing the smaller children. So now the children do not get to interact and see the workings of the church. And I make a lot of my pastor friends mad all the time because I've said to them very clearly, the reason you have children's church is because you're selfish. You want to have more time to get up and, and you already said it, brother do your two two one instead of <laughs> using the services Lord, you giving the children you an active role in the actual yes. service instead of yes. separating them you want to put them to the side so you can have more time to run across the pulpit screaming and hollering and that's not what it's what it's about so we find too many times in in, in the churches that I've attended let me put it this way in the churches that I've attended in many of the churches that I've observed, we spend so much time trying to be the center of the show as the pastors. And we never really engage the people. You know, can I get an amen? And if you if you say amen, I won't preach long. It ain't about you. Sit down and be quiet. Give the people some word, you know? So there are so many things that happen in the church that people do not want to be honest and discuss you know they want to talk about well you know you got to be careful how you how you treat god's preacher no you got to be careful how you treat people no. so now you know you're alienating a group you know then well you know they don't want the preacher to have anything no everyone has a responsibility so if you're teaching tithing and i know we could probably talk about this later so that there are just so many disconnects if i am the only one in the church that's prospering as dr vibe mentioned about the prosperity ministry if i'm the only one that's prospering it's something very wrong with that you know and, and so I, I i i won't call this person's name but it's i think i mentioned to dr vibe is a very dear friend of mine he's a very prominent gospel artist preacher and he kept at his church about buying him a plane Mm. It's a, it's an inner city church. So one day I, I pulled into the side. I said, hey, man, you, you're probably going to ask me out of your office. And I'm being honest with you. I said, but you really should be ashamed of yourself. Well, well, well brother, what do you mean? I said, why 
how do you even have the audacity to stand up and talk to individuals about buying you a plane when you have at least two, three to 5% of people that come to your church catch the city transportation to your church? Mm. They either ride in the city bus or they ride in cabs. I said, we see them every Sunday, not to mention those families that are struggling. And you have the audacity to get up and try to admonish people about buying your plane. So we have to really, really tell the truth. And people get angry and don't really want to talk about the truth as to why we run men away from church, why we run women away from church. It's because preachers seem to forget, I don't care what they say, that the Bible supports pastors being prayed, paid and all of that. That's not what it's about. What it's about is you strengthening your congregation. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, so, Dr. Vibe, uh, you're on mute right now. Um, but uh, I would like you to uh, inter- introduce our new panelists. Well, um, very happy to have Dr. Francis on here. Uh, uh, man, he does so many, so many wonderful things for uh, our people. And I think he's the best person to sh- give an introduction. I didn't like I could give him one, but I don't want to miss anything out. So I'm just happy that he's in the room. Uh, so Dr. Maman Francis, how you doing this evening, brother? How you doing? Can you guys hear me? Yes. We can. Yes, sir. All right. Good to, good so, to, good so to be everyone, on the air with you, brothers. Just, just know now, it's the, the conversation is going to be turned up a notch now. So we're just appetizing right now. The heat. Okay, coming. I'm just. Yeah, I'm just. I'm just. I'm just listening. Um, uh, but it's good to be on the air with all you brothers. Just good to hear um, uh, the conversation. So I, I got the tail end of it. So I'm. I'm right now. I'm listening before I, I speak. Um, well, well you know, the topic is, um, for, oh, yeah. for those who just came here, the topic is, does Christianity interfere with black empowerment? And the first part of this conversation, I want to talk about, because uh, since this is an all male panel, next week is going to be all ladies panel is, um, I, the first part of this conversation, I want to talk about how our young black males, a lot of them, when they get to a certain age, the ones that come up in the church, they drift away from the church for long periods of time. Sometimes, you know, maybe they come back when they 55, 70 or something like that. Um, Because, you know, what I'm saying is, you know, the warrior class is the youth, right? The young men. Um, And our warrior class are they're They're saying that they're not getting anything from church. And so we've been talking about that, that aspect. Dr. Uh, Francis. So Francis. Did we lose you, doctor? Hello? Can you hear me? Uh-oh. Okay, you're on mute, uh, Dr. Vibe. Uh, all right. Dr. Francis, can you hear us? I, I could hear a word a brother was saying. Oh, okay. Uh, that's weird. I, I could hear it. Can you hear me can you hear it now? I can hear you. Oh, okay, uh, ask him to uh, refresh. That okay. usually will... Uh, yeah, yeah. Refresh your screen, doctor. Do a refresh okay. and come back yeah. again. Okay, so... Um, why he... Oh, go ahead. No, I was saying, well, why he doing... Why is he refreshing? Dr. Vibe hit on something that was vital, and it actually reminded me, and it's in my brand new book. You probably didn't ask me to give a plug, but I'm going to throw this in there anyway. Oh, no, it's called the new, the new Age Vernacular, Exposing Worldly Language That Christians Use. Uh, I just came out with this book, and in that is one of the chapters where I deal with what Dr. Vibe had talked about, which is so vital, when he talked about the church is supposed to go ye therefore. And one of the things that we have to do, first of all, we have to start with shifting our our mindsets into thinking that the church is a hospital and treating the church as if it is a hospital. When we see scripture, and when we see not only how Jesus instructed the disciples and the first apostles, and then how Paul instructed those to finish the work that he started, one of the things that the church should resemble, the organic church, is more like a fire station versus a hospital. Is it like we're talking about the men? Men by nature are go getters, they are hunters. You are supposed to give a man something, he's a run with it, he's a fixer, he's a go getter, he's a hunter, he's the provider. So, with that said, if we've taken this element out of the church, you, we've lost that fragrance of what am I to do? And if the whole church transitioned their mindset, instead of trying to hoard people to tell people to come here and be rescued, which is what a hospital does, 
A hospital says, come and bring all the sick here and let us work on you spiritually. That's not what Jesus did. How many times did Jesus invite people to the temple? Even though he preached in the temple, how many times did he invite the world to the temple? That was not Jesus' goal. Jesus was trying to get the church out into the world. And that's what a fire station is. And that's what I talk about in one of the chapters in my book. If we transition to a fire station mentality, guess what? The general public is not invited into the firehouse, but they look at firefighters as loving heroes in the community. Why? Because, because church should be a place where firefighters come and get equipped to do what? Go out and rescue people from fires. When it comes to the fire station, you never know when somebody come and bring a fire to the fire station for it to be put out. You go to where the fire is. And if we bring this fragrance back and attach that to masculinity, the male can again know his natural instinct is to be a hunter, a go-getter, and a provider. That It won't solve everything, but that, of course, could help. Amen. Uh, can you hear Dr. F Francis? Yes, I can hear that. Oh, perfect, perfect. Uh, real quick, uh, in the Get Vocal chat, press one in the chat if you uh, if you can hear us very hear as well. Um, it, it's actually, pretty quiet in the in the chat, so I just want to make sure everybody uh, we're all good in I there. Just to, I just want to touch base with Dr. Francis for just a moment. That one of the things we've been chatting about in the last few minutes is why is there a disconnect, especially with young black men and church? What do you feel? is some of the causes or causes of disconnect between the church and young black men. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, good evening, brothers. Um, um, and I, I apologize for being late. I'm just now getting off my uh, secular job. I've been a, um, a senior pastor now since 2003. I started really young. Um, and um, I, I started a church some 12 years ago. Um, trying to implement the same thing that I believe Brother Crawley was talking about. So I appreciate your comments. Um, so the, to, to answer the question, black men, um, what is the black church doing to, to dissuade black men from coming? I, I believe in so many ways, the, um, when, you, when you talk about certain adjectives that to describe the church, they, the, the, these adjectives are feminized, right? Caring, loving, right? Men, men, um, especially black men, I believe have been ostracized in the black church. And I think the brother was talking about it earlier because they, they see the black church as an extension or a, a flip of what they see on the streets. For, 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 for example, um, they understand a pimp, they understand a hustler, they understand the mentality. They, they understand what, what, what a, a player would do, a, a hustler do, would do on the streets. And what they would look at in the church is the flip side. They see the same kind of hustling, yet they see it done in the name of religion. They see grandparents and grandmothers uh, feel like they're getting hustled in the name of religion. And black men are, are pretty skeptical. One of the reasons why I believe it's hard for the black church to get black men to come in is because the role of a man, uh, we, we define our manhood by our ability to protect and provide. Um, and if we, if the black church is not providing uh, a platform for men to to protect and provide jobs, job security, right? Um, if we're not providing that platform for men, they're not going to come to church in huge numbers. Not only that, um, they've seen historically how Christianity has been used to colonize the black mind, to mm -hmm. subdue us, to take away our color, to take away our passion and our ability to fight and to advocate in our communities. And so because of that, because they've seen how Christianity historically has been used to colonize black folks, a lot of black men shy away from that. Why is it that black men are, are more willing to go to Islam? It's because they feel that they can be empowered as men in that particular religion. Now, do I, do I believe that Christianity empowers black men? Yes, when it is appropriated the right way, when it is communicated the right way. But if we simply um, take the black church and we become like our white counterparts, the black church used to be about um, agitation. Now it's about accommodation, like the brother was talking about. Now it's about um, a prosperity gospel. Now it's, it, it's, it's about um, 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 a creating an aristocracy in the church. Uh, black men are going to reject that. 
black men want to be at a place where they can be real, they can be vulnerable, um, but they also want to be at a place where they can be empowered. And so um, this is why I believe black men are leaving because for whatever reason, they're not, they don't feel like uh, the, 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 the pastor is speaking to them. They're, they're, they're catering to a lot of the emotions of women. Uh, but black men need a voice. Um, and, and, and sometimes the black church does not offer that um, um, in, in, a, in a lot of ways. And so I think it's, it's imperative that we, um, as, as black men, take the black church back. Um, and, and when I say that, I, I think what we have to do is get our voice back and empower men to be men. I know, I, I, I have a, a church, uh, obviously most churches are made, made up of women and I know why they don't come. We don't offer the jobs. We're not offering the resources. I said, if I had, um, um, and, and without relying on the federal government to give me grants and all this stuff, but if we put our money and resources into providing job training for black men, so that men can be men. So when men get out of prison, they're not begging white folks for a job. That they can, we could employ them or we can offer them training there. They would come, right? But we, we, we don't have that in some of our churches. So as a result, black men are not going to, to go. I know a lot of black men that allow their women to go, but they're not running to the church because they're not allowed to be men. Um, and so... I think that's one of the issues. I, I could talk for a while, but that's one of the issues. I think we really need to just um, look at the, the economic opportunities for black <clears throat> men in the church and, and really try to uh, allow men to be men again and allow them to be protectors and providers. Yeah, very well said. Thank you so much for, for that. Uh, real quick, I want to um, give a, a chat room shout out. Um, um, let me say who we have in the chat room. We have... Uh, uh, Adia, we have uh, someone who's uh, in as a guest. We have Mike uh, is in the chat. We have uh, Kiana, Bobby, Dre, uh, Marisa. Uh, we have Shannon, Ryan, Maya, uh, Stephanie as well, and Brother Ramsey's in the chat room as well as uh, Carlos. So uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. And also we have Glory4774 checking us out via um, YouTube. So we're on a lot of different platforms right now. So if you have any questions, please let us know. I will relay them to the panel. And, um, you know, uh, let's get a live discussion. Now, there's another thing, too, when we talk about empowerment um, and maybe some differences between, you know, with Christianity and whatnot is um, I want to talk about Jesus specifically and the way that uh, that Jesus is depicted in our church. Um, first of all, in a lot of our churches still in 2020, he doesn't look like us at all, um, which is, you know, you you would think, right, uh, at least in the black church, right, uh, um, even in the um, vacation Bible school literature as well. And, um, you know, also in the stained glass windows and whatnot. So that's, that's another thing. And then there's this idea that Jesus himself was not a, that he was a pacifist, that Jesus was, um, obviously he didn't look like us. And if you wanted to, is the goal is to be like him that, uh, you know, you're supposed to be docile in some sort of way or whatnot. Um, that mental thing of having the savior, um, depicted, not looking like you, even though, you know, in the Bible, he clearly doesn't look like a, a surfer, you know, uh, you know, uh, some white surfer dude. Um, it's, it's a heavy thing, right? And I remember like even in my church and I, I went to, a, you know, a pretty progressive church and it took a long time before they changed the imagery, you know, and it was because of a lot of people in the church was like, we got to change it, you know, and um, that one that minister I told you guys about, he he was spearheaded that. Um, 
but that's another thing too that I think a lot of young black males and this one we're talking specifically about males because you know next week we're going to talk about the ladies but um, I want uh, I want to start off with you Taylor that uh, talk about how that affects our empowerment um, is by not even connecting our Lord and Savior with us visually right well man that's a that's a big statement that's a big uh thing to address yeah. um i would want to start first by saying that you know even the concept or the term or the thought of black empowerment um it comes with an issue when it comes to something like church mm-hmm. right when it comes to something like the the biblical uh, explanation of what church is what is happening at a church right um because um okay stick stick into the the the, the jesus issue right because i that struck a chord with me because i grew up in a church where it was this very pale jesus you know and it's not like he had a name tag on that said he was jesus but i don't know you just kind of you kind of noted it that that they that that's a depiction of jesus or whatever and mm-hmm. i feel like it can be a great disconnect i feel that because of uh the way society is and the hot topics of society it creates an issue all right and it's like it's in in two different ways number one it's not biblical all right because it's not like the bible is silent as to some sort of appearance of jesus and in my opinion it's not even it, it's not black it's not white it's exactly. it's bronze feet you know what i'm saying i mean some people want to say that that's black it, it's obviously dark it, it clearly shouldn't be pale you understand what i'm saying so it creates the issue because it's it's already laying this this foundation or these tracks to perceive what's happening in a way that's that uh that's other than what the bible is telling teaching or describing uh number two uh as a, a people we do have a history in this country right there's an actual history with the black church you understand like it, it it's it is an issue and i feel like um, those little subtleties, it can create unnecessary schisms or unnecessary discomfort, right? Because a black man would clearly say, like, you, it, there's already a disconnect, you know? If you, and, and a, I, I feel like for me, I grew up in a church, going to church, I wasn't really faced with the, oh, the white man's Jesus, the white man's Jesus, right? Or, or the white Jesus. But then, you know, you hit a certain age and you start hearing certain conversations and people are talking about it. And then you're kind of sitting there like nobody ever mentioned this. Nobody ever said this, you know, biblical Jesus, black Jesus is just, it's not even talked about. And then it's a, now you're offended because, Hey, y'all been slipping this in on me. You know what I mean? So I feel like the imagery uh, plays a big problem, you know, but also the, the term or the concept, the thought of black empowerment right it it conflicts with the story because you know you'll find scripture that's saying in christ there is no woman there is no man there is no can't remember if it says black or white right but no uh slave no scythian no it's, Jew, no it's, free, male no right. free bound you see so so there's this sort of unity that the scriptures are alluding to that black empowerment kind of kind of infringes on but i feel like it's something that deserves attention because of the history that we as black men have you know what i mean so if this topic is going to have any sort of weight or conversation or 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 attention it should be in the black churches definitely Mm -hmm. and i think that's a big problem a a huge problem Mm -hmm. anybody else in the panel that want to tackle that subject yeah you know what if i well actually I, I'm 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 happy to hear Brother Taylor say what he said because I was we were just talking in our congregation Sunday about a similar subject and that simply being when we talk about Jesus and you know how popular the saying what would Jesus do well <clears throat> see we like to cherry pick the Bible number one <laughs> and number and, and we do and and number two is when you say what would Jesus do Jesus knew his assignment that's the part that many preachers do not want to touch when we try to hold individuals up to a standard as we talk about uh, being strong within ourselves, excuse me, being strong and being empowered. Jesus had a specific assignment. You know, he mentions several times, I got to be about my father's business. Whereas we as carnal men, even though 
the Bible talks about, you know, he, he came in the flesh and all of that. He still had a specific assignment. So he knew what his assignment was. He knew that he was going to die on the cross, you know, all of that. But as far as carnal man, then we do not have a specific assignment assigned to us from birth. Only what we are taught through Christianity. Then we say, what is our purpose? What's your purpose? What does Jesus have for you to do? So we start to fashion not only our minds, but the minds of other people according to what we have read scripturally. Therein lies a major conflict with man. And you have a lot of Bible scholars that will refute everything that I'm saying. But no one still can tell you to this day that when Mary was impregnated, the immaculate pregnation, Jesus had a specific assignment. So, but man doesn't have an assignment given to him by God that he knows exactly what's going to happen from every step, even though, you know, the Bible talks about, uh, you know, God knowing us before we were formed in our mother's womb, etc. cetera. Well, that's God knowing us. That's not us knowing God. You, hmm. and so as we talk about empowerment, too many of us as black men who are passive because we choose to be, use that as an escape and always do not want to address faith without works are dead. So I say, let's pray about it. Let's have a prayer vigil. Then we can go home. No, we can't go home because other things have to happen. Other things have to be put in place. It doesn't mean that we get an AK-47. However, it does mean that we have to understand the politics of the world it does mean we have to know how to maneuver. Uh, uh, Pastor uh, French talked about that a moment ago. Uh, it does mean that we have to to employ. So there are a lot of things that that human beings refuse to discuss because it makes people have conversations about what really is, and they can't just run and hide behind the Bible and say, "Well, you have to put your faith in God and don't question God's word." So there's so many things floating, and I know we can't talk about all this in one show, but there's so many things out there. And so I bring that up simply because I've always been, quote, an activist. And it bugs me to no end when I, <clears throat> excuse me, hear my fellow brothers of the cloth stand in church and talk about the things that's happening with our young people, all of the ills of the world, but you can't push them out of the church's door. Now, if you say we're going to have a prayer vigil, they'll show up for the cameras. <laughs> However, that's about as far as it goes. So I'll leave it there. Mm. Can, oh, go ahead, brother. Carl. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say on the image thing, uh, one of the things about it that we're seeing a lot now, and it's in every facet, not just color and race, but other areas, is that we need to be aware of victim's theology because victim's theology set us up, sets any victim up to overcorrect and feel validated in the overcorrection. Here's what I mean by that. Um, because so, if someone does you wrong, you don't win by trying to one-up them. You mm -hmm. win by trying to be disciplined enough to let them know that, look, you're not going to pull me out of my character and out of my integrity. And a lot of times, what, going back to the image thing is this. Because it goes without saying, it is a proven fact. Yes, the gospel over here has been whitewashed. No, the images are not right. No, they're not accurate. But at the same time, what it does, we want, we want to make sure that we're not careful, that we won't try to set the proof that he's just as black as we are either. Because the same scriptures, if we really look at even in the original language that we want to try to go to, that was actually giving you a spiritual rhetoric about how his eyes were as fire. It was as war. So what I'm saying is that a lot of, and that's one reason why even when we look at the original language, even when it comes back to Leviticus, why it says don't like erect certain images, because if we do that, our faith won't be in God, it will be in that image. Now, why is, why is it important for us as African-Americans to hear this? Because we more than anybody is susceptible to our image. Why? Because of what we have went without because of slavery. What have we went without? the one who was supposed to give us our image and our identity, that being the black father. So here's the thing. When we look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we go throughout scripture from Old and New Testament, 
God related through individuals who weren't as mature yet. God related to him through what? Their fathers. This is why he said, just like the God of your father. And so if our fathers were in place to give us their image, we wouldn't fight so much to make an image that we could relate to. That's why That's God given everybody fathers. Now, if we had our daddy in place, we would have enough confidence. We would, we would know our worth already to where we won't try to struggle to now pull the image. The reason why I'm saying this is because the overcorrection to what I'm talking about is the doctrine like the black Hebrews that we see seeping across the country. And not a, one of the reasons, not only Islam, but there's a growing rate in, in, in black Hebrew and black Hebrew Israelites. Why? Because they are appealing to the black voice because they are telling black people, you are the original true people. When if you study the genie, this is one reason why God in the Bible told, instructed us, don't, it said avoid controversies or arguments about genealogies. That's in the scripture. One of the reasons why is because it sets us up to overcorrect and we fail to go back to our first love, which is Jesus Christ. Why do we love Jesus? Not because he do or don't look like us. I'm not saying what he looked like. The point is, just like the Bible says, we please him and we come to him. Why? In faith, not in a physical color. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, because in overcorrection, here's one thing about Satan. Satan don't care what side of the road you are off on, just as long as you're not in between the lines and in the boundaries. And what can happen in victim theology, yes, we are victimized and, and things are off the road on this side, but what we do in victim theology, our goal don't become to be right. Our goal to our goal becomes to separate us so far from the up from the thing that hurt us, and then we'll find ourselves on the opposite side of the road, if that makes sense. Mm. Totally makes sense. Makes sense. I want I want Amen. I want to just uh, piggyback on, uh, on brother, brother, brother Crawley. Um, Genesis one twenty six says that man was made in the image of God. He's, God speaking to himself said, let us make man in our own image. And so we can't make God in our image. We are made in his image. So we are a reflection of him instead of him, us. God encompasses all. Um, but, but, but also, I, I want to touch on, because I think he, he nailed it when he talked about the victim theology and because of the lack of the black father and stuff like that, we, we try to create a, a, a Jesus sometimes in our, our own image. Um, but getting back to the, the, the white Jesus and, and why I believe that it was the blonde hair, blue eyed, obviously, just, just historically looking at the, the region in which he came from, we know that could not historically be correct. But that was such a, 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 a huge tool of white supremacy because we looked at that Jesus and we saw our masters in that Jesus. And because we looked at the one who oppressed us as God, we could not see, therefore, God in ourselves, right? And so, therefore, it allowed for a, a, a system of self-hatred. Uh, you guys remember the, the episode of Good Times where, uh, you know, James put up the black Jesus? Right. That that looked like the wino. Remember that episode? Right. And the episode ends with the white Jesus coming back up. Right. But that white Jesus, and I never thought about it when I was a kid, it stayed there. And she had this love affair with this, this picture of white Jesus saying, no, James, this has to be the real Jesus. Now, the reason why James loved the black Jesus, because he believed that that black Jesus gave him a little luck. Right, it, it, it gave him some 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 temporary um, earthly favor, right? And as long as he, he it gave him that, he was fine with it. But Florida Evans it was such a strong patriarch. But even in that, she was in love with this image of this white Jesus, which I believe has been used as a tool of white supremacy. Um, we know that Jesus, even as a child, Jesus fled from um, Herod. By going to Egypt, if he had blonde hair, blue eyes, the last place you want to go to <laughs> is Egypt because you're going to stand out, right? So we know Moses had to be. Moses had to be. Moses put his hand. He said, "Put your hands in your cloak." Came out and was white. Okay, it was a brother. Okay, so I, I say that to say this. Um, I, you know, I, I tell everybody. You know, Chinese folk want a Chinese Jesus, that's fine. White folk want a white Jesus, that's fine. Black folks want a black, that's fine. You know, but I agree with Brother Crawley said that, again, it gets dangerous when we say this is, you know, because I believe the scripture, the silence 
of the scriptures speak value, right? Um, there, there are images that we get in Revelations that say it's like this, it's like this. But again, I, I think that um, because we've been so oppressed, and I think he nailed it, that we, 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 we feel like we need these images um, uh, to, to validate ourselves because of the lack of the fathers. And the, and the lack of black men in church go way back uh, to way the Exodus back. account. Remember what Pharaoh said? Pharaoh said, let the girls live. But he says, kill those boys, right? And, and so Dr. Kenjufu said a long time ago, he says, I don't believe there's a conspiracy against black men. The conspiracy is against black boys. So if we kill them off as boys developmentally, they will never grow up to be men. And so there's a sense of arrested development. This is why we see grown men still acting like kids because they were drowned, drowned in the educational system, drowned in the criminal justice system. We're drowning our boys. So our boys are drowned, and, and therefore they, they don't know who they are. Um, and, and so I, I think it's imperative that, that as, as, as men, as we look at Christianity, we see a Jesus that's vulnerable, a Jesus that wept. But because of the absence of black fathers, and we know slavery was not the thing that tore up black homes and black fathers and black marriage, right? But we're talking about a recent phenomenon that happened in the last, you know, 40 to 50 years that black men were strategically taken out of the home, economically castrated. And because of that, we're looking for father figures in all of the wrong places. And because mm -hmm. of the lack of true discipleship in churches, right, we're not making disciples. That's what we were supposed to do. We're making clones, right? We want people to do exactly what we do because of the lack of discipleship in these churches, black young black boys are looking for strong figures. And because of, and I can talk about so many things, the, the flight of the black middle class to the suburbs and only coming back sometimes on Sundays, now they're not coming back at all because they're going to these mass, these white multicultural churches where now the, the, the one institution that we had, if we look at the black church bringing in you know, anywhere between 14, 16 million dollars every Sunday is the, the the longest, strongest, thriving black business that we have. Now it is being disseminated, not by attacking us through segregation, but really through assimilation, which is the black brain drain. It's taken away our resources. It's taken away what we had in our churches that, you know, in our communities, that was our economic thrust. And because of that, because of the, the absence of black men in the, the, the neighborhoods, now the only person they have to look up to in the, in the inner cities are a little Wayne, right? Or whoever the white media pumps up as the next role model, instead of having that black doctor and lawyer that goes to the same church as you. Now we don't have that. And so I think there's a, there's a huge void there, but I, I think Brother Crawley nailed it. It is, a, it, it, it is because of the absence of the black men. This is why you don't see this in church because the, 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 that brother, if 70% of our homes are headed by women uh, and, and they rely on the church to have some kind of man or something, you, you know, in, in the home because of the lack of discipleship in the home and in the church, our young brothers are just going anywhere. They, they don't know where to go and what to do. So there's this huge void that I think black men have to go ahead and, and, and fulfill in the uh, black churches. Amen. Yes. Um, now, I really feel like um, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in our communities. And those a lot of times those who are in the church, uh, brothers, you know, um, they try to they try to validate not doing stuff based on their Christianity. And which really annoys me. Right. Um, a lot of people use scriptures. I'm, I'm not a biblical scholar. You guys know way better than I. But they'll say stuff like turn the other cheek. Right. And. The, you know, stuff like that, they'll use to not do things that empower their communities and whatnot. And, you know, and different things. And. I don't believe that Christianity is supposed to make you weak. I don't believe that Christianity is, is supposed to be 
where it you don't empower your communities, you don't stand up for yourself. You know, the black church has a has a long history of protection of our communities. If you go back like the um the civil rights movement, them churches had guns. Okay? They understood what they were going up against. They understood that that your church is supposed to be a place where you can be protected at. And going back to, you know, we can go we can go back to to Nat Turner, right? And I feel like you, you know, I feel like there's this thing that sometimes is in our community that Christianity is supposed to make you passive or weak or not stand up for yourself. And, you know, um, I want to start off with you, Brother Crawley. Um, you know, this idea of turning the other cheek or, you know, or I'm just going to pray the devil away, but not do anything to, to get him off your back, <laughs> you know, but you're just going to pray him away. <laughs> So uh, can you just talk to, 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 to that, some of these, um, I don't even know if it's just excuses or is it a bad understanding of scripture or, I mean, can you just talk to that? Yeah, uh, yes, sir. I think it's a little bit of both. And then not only that, it depending on how we are quantifying uh, passive and weak, because there were plenty of times when my Lord and Savior purposely had the power to do something and chose not to do it. Mm -hmm. Not only did he ignore the lies that was told on him, uh, you know, he he purposely, he said he didn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Him being God still could have. He chose not to. Not to. And a, a wise man told me, my, my pastor, God rest his soul, years ago, and it stuck with me. He said, he said meekness with the M, meekness is not uh, the absence of strength or weakness. He said meekness is strength under control and the reason why i want to say that is because i mm -hmm. think if we start with the gospel and christianity this is one thing that should really line up even all of our decisions making and to do on to be what our flesh don't tell us to be sometimes and it is this paul exemplified this in the in in, in philippians the first chapter once we get tunnel vision to understand christianity is here to make sure that christianity itself is the focal point and what I mean by that, our job, as long as we become the part of the true remnant, is no longer self-preservation, but to make sure that the message don't stop going forth. Now, that doesn't mean that at times we don't defend. That don't mean that at times we don't fight. We see all of this in Scripture. But but the thing about it is, it's hard to blanket certain statements when we get along here, because if we're led by the Holy Spirit, our job is not self-preservation or even a pride behind a race it is empower we empower ourselves when we are more like christ and if we're more like christ we take his sentiments on which is what first things first everything is about the gospel even if i lose so that the gospel could win and this is what is exemplified in philippians uh paul was excited that though he was experienced bad times and he was even you know wrongly or falsely accused or even in jail he says listen but I can rejoice because the message is even going for more because there are people who have a boldness with it. So I'm mm -hmm. just saying that there are times that whereas, yes, you're totally right. We, we try to get lazy and try to, we take scripture out of context to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And so we do have a lot of lazy uh, people, black, white, and indifferent. But here's one thing that I do know. Uh, race, because we, we tend to think that the world is like the same everywhere and it is not. In America, we think that everything hinges on black and white, and it doesn't. And we will see in the future years that the biggest thing is not going to be black versus white. It's going to be saved versus non-saved. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? And that's actually the timeline for all of the earth. So the reason why I'm saying all this is because there will be times where Christianity put us in situations where as we do have the strength to go ahead and knock somebody out. <laughs> <laughs> but the Bible says... Don't let them know who you are and what you really can do only because to preserve this moment, because later on, they're going to see, you know what I'm saying? That look, you're going to show more Christ and make me more convincing because a lot of times we, our flesh can let us want to, it, it can lead us into wanting to prove and show who we are, even if we show who Christ is on the back burner. So it's like Christ, mm -hmm. I don't want to show you right now. I want to show <laughs> me. You see what I'm saying? But look at Jesus. He has so many opportunities to do that. And that's why I'm glad nobody was God but him, because I'm telling y'all, we probably would all agree. If I was God, I'm going to let people know every time I get a chance, 
who I am, but I'm thank God that he was there. And so sometimes it even leads me to conviction that even though I'm experiencing bad things, and yes, it goes without saying, we as black folks have been done unjustly and we are still been treated unjustly. It make it makes me furious when a black person can sit in their own living room in their own house and somebody break in your house talking about they thought it was their house and shoot you. <laughs> we know that the times are evil. We know that we as a black people have been done wrong. But Jesus bringing upon times was said, listen, he says a soft answer turns away wrath because the end goal is not to prove black, to make black top or to make show black what black can do. The end goal is make sure we do whatever we can to make sure that the message outshines us. Mm. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. May I, may, may I just say a little bit about that, Kente? Sure, and please. Brother Crowley, I, Brother Crowley I, I hear you. I hear you very, very loud, and I'm agreeing with you. When we talk about weakness, when we talk about meekness, and when we talk about what the Bible say and moving God's word forward in spite of ourselves, there, there are still, as, as we talked about earlier, so many dichotomous pieces here when we know that the Bible has been tampered with, when we know that according to the greatest scholars in the world, that the most accurate Bibles that we have on record is the King James Version. And when they tell us that the King James Version is only 97% accurate, 3% is huge. When we have the Apocrypha, uh, which is uh, the uncanonized versions of the Bible. So there are so many things that, that we have to be uh, uh, cognizant of as we teach the Bible, as we talk about the Bible, as we talk about strength, and as we talk about weaknesses, as we talk about the civil rights movement. And we can go, uh, you know, people love to talk about Dr. King. It's Black History Month. Well, as we know, Dr. King became the pastor of Ebenezer Church because Dr. Johns, his predecessor, was run off because of his views about being strong through the Bible and not being weak. Then they got Dr. Right. King. We, we also know that That's with right. Dr. King, even though the media would like to make us think that Dr. King was passive, he was anything but. Now, he preached about nonviolence, but the only speech that your oppressor wants you to hear is the I have a dream speech. Dream you know, he, he yes. talks about, you know, we, we, we are, we are coming to get our check and all of this, but you never hear those speeches holistically. So that that's why I'm saying I'm not debating you. You're not debating me. I, I, I'm just addressing our brother Kente's question. When we deal with so many different factions of, of human beings that identify ourselves as Christians, uh, that and, and as I said earlier, because of the definition that has been given to people like myself that identify as activists, etc., there are certain things that has to happen. Case in point, I ask two questions all the time. Where is Martin assassinated? Where is Malcolm assassinated? Who assassinated Markham? Allegedly the government. Who assassinated Malcolm? Allegedly the government in cahoots with the Muslims, but they're both assassinated. One was just fine. Lyndon Johnson said, let's deal with Martin as opposed to dealing with Malcolm because Martin message is softer. But the minute Martin started talking about economic development, then Martin became expendable. So when we are talking, especially to our young people and to our older guys, even like us, is that it's a fine line, uh, uh, Kente, as, as Brother Crawley is laying out, it's a fine line. And that a lot of times would run men away from God is because we don't take time to have conversation and in the young men's vernacular, we don't chop it up enough. You know, we quote scripture, which is great, but as we know, as we know, Bill's above knew the Bible better than anybody. <laughs> so so we all know that. So I'm just saying, just uh, uh, for the sake of talking about meekness and mildness and, and that kind of thing, it's a it's a, 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 a very serious piece that has to be carefully maneuvered and discussed and laid out because we don't want to, to lose anyone in the fight. We all know that none of us are bigger than Christ, if we right. so believe. We all know that the main message going forward 
is about Christ and his goodness. We all know that if everybody decided that I'm going to take matters into my own hands, then it would be an apocalypse. So I'm just saying, I'm not debating. I agree with Brother Crowley. I'm just saying just uh, the, the young people that, that most of us encounter, you know, is that we have to be very careful as to how we really break this thing down to them as we talk about scripture, but we also have to lay other foundations as well just to bring them aboard. So I just want to address the question, not debating. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I, can I say this? And I, and I know I've, I've talked a lot and forgive me, brother, no, no, but just, um, but just uh, talk about the, 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 the reason just kind of answer your, your, your question about um, why black men tend to shy away from the, the Christian church and how they think it, it, it pacifies them. The, the black tr- preacher historically, even in slavery was one of the few slaves that were literate, knew how to read. But the black slate, the black preacher was used, as we saw in, in the movie um, about Nat Turner, yeah. was used in a lot of ways as a pacifier to pacify the slaves. He would, you know, Harry um, too, yeah, yeah, yeah take too. take the scriptures out of context and say, "Slaves, obey your masters." Mm-hmm. Right? Take everything out of context. Tell them your heaven is on the other side. Therefore, mm-hmm. there's there's no need to rebel uh, to, to to feed into white capitalism. To to feed into white exploitation of, of African labor, right? And so, the question I think we have to ask ourselves is: Has the role of the black pastor changed, right? And just in the last several years, has the black pastor been used to pacify the masses of people and take away their political bite, right? The yes, <laughs> we we understand. <laughs> okay, I'm just asking. I'm just asking the, the <laughs> audience, right? We, we Right. Do what is the role of the black church in the black community? Is it the same as the, the role of the white church in the white community? Right. We know that the Bible teaches Should be. color coordination. The white church talks about color blindness. We don't see race. We don't see color. OK. When the, the scriptures teach in Galatians three, there is no Jew or Gentile or no male, no female. Does, does that mean when I give my life to God, I'm no longer a man? Does that mean when I give my life to God, I'm no longer a, a Jew or uh, I'm no longer a, a, a black man or white, right? So we have to we have to look at these things in context, right? I don't, again, don't believe the Bible teaches color blindness, but again, color coordination. Um, but I, I think we have to start looking at the role of the pastor, right? And I think that, because the pastor historically has always been one of the most trusted men or women in the black community, right? That pastor is the one because the old. black pastor serves so many. And, and I know because I get up from the pulpit every week and I'm by vocation. I'm also assistant principal at a high school. But the black pastor serves so many roles. We preach. We teach. We're psychiatrists. We're counselors. Okay. That's when, the problem. When, when, when members get sick, <laughs> we got to go nurse. That's we we got to bring the food. Nobody wants the deacons. Everybody wants to sing your pastor. Pray with me. Pray with me. We, we serve so many so many roles right and 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 then I, it's hard for black men to to want to come in because s- sometimes those 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 pastors and just speaking for pastors they feel used up right um black pastors are, are, are dealing with high blood pressure diabetes i was about to diets. say that yeah you, you know I, I mean because we serve so many roles within our community right and so it's hard to even get men who want to, one, come into the ministry, and two, even want to stay in the ministry because you got to deal with, excuse me, Negroes that have crept in the vineyard or crept in the church <laughs> that don't know how to treat black folk, right? Or treat, treat their pastors or give them a bunch of gifts, but then give them hell during the week. So it's, 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 a, it's a difficult thing. Um, so I, I would say this, when you talk about... Um, the, the, the black church's role and something and why black men don't want to come I, I think a lot of it is because they have eliminated the social gospel uh, from the church and because we have taken on sometimes the mindset um, and because you know we've been colonized through Christianity in so many ways of our white counterparts and we believe if it works in their neighborhood it should work for us and then we take away the social gospel and so they teach that they're pro-life. Well, we're pro-life in our church too. 
But our pro-life extends beyond the abortion room all the way to the courtroom. That's when they stop, right? And so because of this, a lot of black men says no, because now becoming Christian becomes a cultural dilemma. Because in order to become Christian and because Christianity has been used in a lot of our communities to divide us through denominationalism, tribalism, right? I can't uh, start a business with another brother because he's Methodist and I'm Baptist or he's Church of Christ, he's Church of God in Christ. And so a lot of young black men said, this is tribalism. This thing has been used and some of these denominations have been started by white men and we have taken on their doctrine and it has been used to divide us in our churches. So no, they don't want to come to church because they say, look, I want to go ahead and start a business or do business with another brother from another denomination, even if we disagree on certain uh, doctrinal points. So that, that's that's what I believe. I can keep going forever, but that's the problem. Yeah. Like, yeah, you, but what yeah. you just hit on, what it's you just hit though, on, brother. yeah, what you just hit on was exactly why we have to challenge every church has to challenge our ecclesiology and methodology of what we call church, it, it, even exactly. back down to what we have defined or we think we have defined the biblical roles of Christian leadership as far as pastoral care. You know what I'm saying? Because True. it's all it's off. When we read the yes, scriptures, sir. especially the New Testament ecclesia, and we see it what we're doing now, our method, our old wine scan was never biblical, but we think it has validity because <laughs> it precedes our birthday. Yes. You know what I'm saying? That's so right. now, now we got to say things like, black church white church versus when paul wrote letters to a regional church and so what yeah. we but here's the thing so now in, in our dichotomy in our stuff we can't even wrap our mind around what that looked like because we can't get past the petitions that we have built up that stands in, in the way of our own prayers the black mm -hmm. church is not only black church the white church it is now using to divide even our own families one of the reasons why it, why why a lot of men are turned off by church, not all but a lot, because he sees the church as his competition. Because he got to he got to compete against the church for his woman. Right. We have Man. we we Lord think Jesus. now we think now it's old fashioned to tell women serve your husband. You got more scriptures about how you serve your husband than you do how you serve the house of God. We are out of order, but we preach. I gotta be I gotta be good to the church. No, don't let don't let your house be dusty and you washing dishes at the church. Right. You know. <laughs> Here's, here's right. the thing. We have right. allowed we have allowed right. ministry yeah. to get in the way of true ministry. And that's what the yeah. doctor was talking about. This is one reason why not only men of all levels don't want to come in, because first of all, we got to when 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 their women come to us, we got to not be afraid to have a backbone because the Bible haven't changed to teach. Now, women, you are supposed to be so you supposed to be submissive. And even if your husband is unsaved, you are more likely to win him to Christ by your yes. servanthood. Service but I know that's new. Age, that's but that goes against new age theology. So now you you'll get cussed out for saying stuff like that. And we say, oh, yeah. you're making women second class citizens. It's like, no, we're trying to help you win your husband. And we're trying to help you eliminate his competition. The church is not his competition. It is his way to where him and his woman can grow one in Christ. So, exactly. so many things. And I don't, I want to stop there because that is my area. A challenging yeah. church ecclesiology and methodology because we have gotten it all off. One of the reasons why the doctors are, uh, not doctors, but pastors are, which I am one and I have been one, now for a couple of years one of the reasons why it's all but i go over those statistics in my seminars pastors battle with depression uh they have some of the worst family oh, life geez. and guess what they are oh, ranked geez. among the highest people who have the least amount of closest friends yep mm. right. statistically wow. there is a problem with what we call church and how we operate and it is not founded and have validity in the scripture wow. no, no you, you're absolutely right that's why i tell i just say this i tell my members all the time, if you're single, don't bring me to your home. Don't say, oh, Dr. Francis said, Pastor said, I oh, don't bring me in that home. Right? <laughs> He's the man of that. Don't, 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 don't do that. You're going to turn him off. Let him watch his game and just serve him and through your service. And and, and, and Peter says in First Peter chapter 3. That's the Bible. Words, That's exactly right. Words, you win him over. Stop begging him and stop nagging, nagging. him from the church without yeah. words. Because he's not looking at what you say. He's looking at what you what do. You Amen. Amen. Um, before that's like empowerment right there, Doctor. That, that's for sure. Be, before we get on out of here, um, Taylor, I want to go to you. Um, now, you, I, if I remember correctly, you came back to uh, to the church or to uh, to the Bible um, fairly recent, right? Um, it's been about. 
Uh, about 12, 13 years now. Okay, so it's been it's been a while. Yeah. What was it that that um I, I think you talked about it on another show, but I want you to kind of talk about what was it that brought you back? Oh man, it was a mistake. <laughs> it, it wasn't a a plan. I wasn't like trying to get back to God or anything like that. Um I actually make a long story short, I was I started uh, going to marriage counseling. I found a, a need in my life for marriage counseling. And what happened was the marriage counselor was also a pastor. So what would happen is, you know, in these sessions that we would have, the, pa- the pastor would always say, you know, these bizarre things. And it got to the point where I just felt like, you know, you just saying this because, you know, I haven't read the Bible. Right, it's like you want to quote the scripture, and then you say, <laughs> you know, it's like I told you last week. No, I ain't never read, you know, yeah. Habakkuk. Yeah. Right? You understand? Yeah. So, so you know, it kind of started there because, the, but then what you know, when I go and and look in the scriptures, lo and behold, just what they said would be there is there, you know. So, I kind of started kind of uh, holding this person in a, in a really in, in high esteem and and so on and so forth, but. Uh, as I started reading the book, like reading the story, instead of just going to read a verse, go read the chapter, right? Instead of just going to read a chapter, read the book, like the more that that happened, the more I found that context was important, you know, but in, anyway, what brought me back around to the Bible was nothing of my, I, I wasn't trying to come back, you know, I wasn't trying to come back to church, come back to God, anything like that. It, I just... I was challenged with reading the scriptures for the first time. And and now it's like, I honestly feel that's the most important thing, man. Because even when you said something like, how do you dress or how, how do you deal with this turn the other cheek thing? You know what I'm saying? Before you can really take in turn the other cheek, you have to understand why you turn the other cheek, right? You're not turning the other cheek because it just simply looks better. You're not turning the other cheek because... You know, someone needs you to turn the other cheek. No, it has every like like Brother Crowley was saying. You know, this has to do with the furtherance of the gospel, right? So sometimes it'll for the furtherance of the gospel, it'll be better for me to turn the other cheek, right? Jesus. But then sometimes for the furtherance of the gospel, it'll be better for me to get on your on your behind with some whoops and coat. You know, whoops, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And it all depends on, on the situation, circumstance, you know, but. And, and and also like in my in coming back to the scriptures, I found this uh this very the best word I could think of is organic formula for church and a gospel and the administration of God. You know, whereas right now it's like the scene is dominated by people who are are trying to make things a certain way. You know, we want to do it a certain, we want to do it this way, we want to do it that way, and. You know, look, look at look at Paul on the Damascus Road. You know what I'm saying? Where was his strength, power, and will before he was turned? You know, and and that's the thing with Christianity. Mm. It's so much of a mm. you, you have to be in a and I, and I almost feel like that has something to do with the remember you were saying like with the warrior class or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like at a certain age you go away. You know what I'm saying? Listen, man, the the marriage bed is undefiled, but sex is not holy. And that might sound like way off and bizarre, but unfortunately, a very important part of the gospel message is our filth and our dirt and our human inclinations, you know what I'm saying? Which is not always in alignment with an an eternal way of living. It might be okay if all you're going to be on this earth is for 80 years, right? And you could protect your own for maybe 80 years, 90 years. But at the end of the day, the gospel is talking about something that goes on into eternity. So anyway, I just um, I think that uh, there is a, a powerful organic story within the scriptures. You know what I mean? I hope that makes sense. You, you know, what's bananas to me. And, th- and thank you so much, t- Taylor. You know, what's so bananas to me is there's so many people who uh, identify as they're Christians. I'm not talking about they was Christians last week. They've been Christians for a, a long time. Ain't never read the Bible. Now, yeah. what I mean is, yeah, they've gone to church and they say turn to this chapter, you know, that chapter. They read it like that, if you want to call that reading it, but have never just like read the whole Bible. They haven't studied it. They haven't studied it. It, it is. 
Yeah, and I make a I make a quick distinction now. I've learned to make a distinction between church people and the remnant. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I, I always I always say this that the the Great Commission, Jesus says, go out make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teach them to observe whatsoever command. Yes, sir. He said, go make disciples. He didn't say go make Christians. Christian yeah. really was a derogatory term. Okay, they were first called Christian Christians at Antioch. At Antioch. It was a derogatory term. The first century church, they preferred the term disciple. Now, you can be a Christian by what you preach, mm -hmm. but you can only be a disciple by what you practice. Mm -hmm. And the church needs less Christians and more disciples. Amen. Amen. And if any man be my disciple, he must first learn to deny self, take up his cross, and follow me. Disciple, yeah. disciple, disciple. That's an apprentice. Can it, right? and, and, but you know what? But he he just gave a picture of why we talked about Islam. One of the reasons why Islam is more appealing to black people is because their discipleship program yes, is yes. stronger. Yep. Right. That's you it. follow yeah. what I'm saying? And the church, the church, we're too busy letting ministry get in the way of ministry that we don't have time to disciple. You know what I'm saying? Yes. The Islam be like, come here, brother, we're gonna grab you and take you on our wing. Yep. Church says Take two of these scriptures and call us next Sunday. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? And you got to get part. And like, I, this is what I, this is one thing I teach about the difference between biblical Christianity and what we have today. Jesus, when he stepped onto the scene of the disciples, the first thing that he granted them was not a sermon. It was not even information about him. The first thing Jesus granted the disciples was access to his life. Mm. That's what he did. And that's the last thing that you get from the average pastor because we nope. too busy. To give you access and that's one reason why black males are not coming because we guess what we are all magnets think about the men that was important in our life or the people that we looked up to they were magnets to us because if we didn't have access we wanted it you yeah. know and that's the thing about fatherhood and discipleship that's why i like what uh dr francis says let's make if we're going to make the disciples there's no such thing as a disciple without having access to you and, and I, I, I no, i'm sorry we in church now because probably is opening up some stuff. <laughs> think, think about when Jesus starts his ministry. He starts it at age 30, right? And he starts off with a validation in the Jordan River. It comes up from the water, and the father says, This is my son in whom I will please. So there is a validation. And so he, uh, he nailed it when he, he could have shut it down uh, uh, an hour ago when he talked about the absence of the black father. That validation that black men need. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He hadn't turned water into wine. He hadn't fed the 5,000. He hadn't raised Lazarus. In other words, I'm well pleased with him before he scores a touchdown, before he slam dunks a ball, before he gets a 4.0. It's not even yep. based on what he does, but based on who he is. He says, I am well pleased. And that's what these yes. young black men are looking for. Validation from daddy. Yes. If I have that, and the reason why they're having problems uh, understanding a relation to a, a, a spiritual father because they don't have the relationship to the physical father. Physical father. That's, right. that's the reason why. That's right. the reason why. Right. 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 So, so let, let, let me also say this. We, and, 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 and because of this, this ide ideology of black men in this country, right? We got to be strong, right? All time. I grew up in the ghetto. We had to be hard, right? Just hard for no reason, tough. We didn't know how to break down. We didn't because that was being a punk, oh oh right? you preaching, right? We, we, we didn't know how to we didn't know how to do. So we have this persona, right, of being this strong man, right? I think of the well, who was the strongest man in the Bible, Samson. Samson. Think about think about Samson. He grew up as a church boy, right? Mm -hmm. He grew up. Hey, his parents said can't never drink alcohol, never went to a barber shop, couldn't be around the dead, right? So you, you, you talk about those 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 three things, right? His associations, right? Couldn't be around things that are dead. His appetite, couldn't drink. And then his appearance, could not cut his hair. Think about those three things. He violated two thirds of those his Nazarite vow all the time. He was always going through vineyards, had no problem drinking. He had no problem touching things that are dead, touching the, de the carcass of the dead lion. He, he violated that most of his life. The only thing that he had left, right, was what? His hair, his appearance. And what do church folk care about more than anything? Oh, you're they, bringing it down, they dog. Oh, you're they bringing it down. The appearance. And as long as I got the appearance, you're I'm bringing cool. it now. You're bringing but, but it what down. Happens, what happens 
What happens is God says, I'm going to now allow you to look like how you've been living, right? Mm. The access to strength. We all want that strength, right? We want the strength of Samson, but it took God taking away his ability to see man in order for him to see God. And, and sadly enough, we something has to be taken away from us as black men in order for us to see God. And then think about it, at the end of his <laughs> life, he had to rely on a boy. The boy had something he had didn't have, which was sight. The young boy did not have the strength, but he had the sight. Sadly enough, now we're looking to the next generation because they're guiding us because we're blind to so many things. Mm. So many things in the Lord. We are blind to. So we now look to the next generation. This is why it was the next generation that inherited the precious gifts of God. They're the ones, 20 and under, that crossed Jordan. We are still in the, the, the wilderness. We're going in circles in the church. This is why nobody wants to, to, to be a part of that. There's a Joshua generation that's coming up in the church. This is not a generation of compromise. This is a generation of conquest. They're ready to cross Jordan and take Jericho because they are believing, because they were not born in Egypt. They were not born with a lot of the religious traditions that we have had. That's why the book of Joshua starts off saying what? My servant Moses is dead. Not your servant, my servant. He served my purposes. Moses is dead. And that was the first funeral God performed. And he says, I had to bury him because I know you guys would worship him. Now you mourn, but it's time to move on. And so the black church, if we look at it, and when I say black church, I'm talking about sociologically because we, we understand there's only one church. But, but again, when we look at the, the black church, as we know it sociologically, has to be able to move on. If we're not able to move on, then I'm telling you right now, we're going to die in the wilderness. Now, it doesn't mean that we ignore our faith traditions and, and, and all the strength that we, we inherited from our forefathers. I think we take that along with us. But at the same time, we must, be, we must transform past our traditions in the black church that have been going on for, for years that are really sucking the lifeblood. When God tears a tradition down, just like he tore down Jericho, he said, anybody that reveals this city, you will do so at the expense of the, your babies and the next generation. And so as a result, we've been trying to rebuild Jericho, but we're doing it at the expense of our young people. And this is why you have something like a Black Lives Matter, one of the, you know, the, the, the latest, the, the first mm. civil rights movement without a religious base. They're saying, look, we don't even want a religious base. We don't even want it because and, and now some, sometimes they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater because they're done with religion. And this is the very thing that Jesus Christ came to get rid of, religion. He says, I don't want religion. Man, I always showed religion. He wanted us to have relationship. And this what Brother Crowley was talking about, relationship, access to me, discipleship. That's what we're, this is why our young people are uh, on Instagram and, and, and doing all these things and Facebook and all this. And, and, and showing themselves and talking about their lives. It's like, wait a minute, I know when I was young, when I did dirt, I didn't want nobody to know about it. <laughs> right. People are putting it out there. Why? Because they're longing for belonging. They want community. They want relationships. They want somebody to touch and feel. They want somebody that is that that, that, that is vulnerable. Some of these pastors, again, they're so standoffish. You don't inspire me. You intimidate me. I need somebody that has made mistakes that I can relate to that I can say, thank you, I'm learning from your mistakes, and now teach me the ways of the Lord. Damn. Damn. Yeah, I'm wow. saying, Amen. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, Dr. So, Vibe, yeah. uh, do you want to uh, do uh, one last thing before we... Uh... Me? Yeah, no, you want to ask one last question before <laughs> on, we uh, nah. we say goodbye? Uh, you know what? I think, um, as Dr. Frenzy said, the relationship you know the, the relationship is so important with the church and if you're not relating you're deflating that's right all right all right if you're not relating you're, and be be open don't be like I, I don't really have too much too much more to say that people and not just young people people of all ages want relationship yeah. Yeah. it's not our young 
are young black men, are older black men. They want the relationship. If it's a good black church, they're going to have those intergenerational conversations between That's older right. black men and younger black men, right? You have to go, you know, you have to go out there and you have to meet them where they're at, right? And you got to get rid of the clicks. Oh my gosh, we won't even go there. We all got to get rid of the clicks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got to get rid of the clicks. Now, right? Yes. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's so silly to me that uh, you, like, you're talking about like the, the clickishness in in um, the churches and stuff like that. And it's like, really, like we're all supposed to be here for the same reason. But, um, yeah, um, I want to just uh, to let people know next week we have the ladies will be here and um, they are going to uh, continue this conversation uh, from their point of view. So I wanted to make sure that that was going to happen. So, uh, Brother Andrew, I think you know uh, Sister Angie. She's going to yes. be on, and uh, Shannon is going to be yes. on, as well as Dr. Tachi and uh, L.A. Wade. So that'll be a very interesting uh, conversation with those fine ladies. Uh, I'm going to start off uh, with you, Taylor. How can we get you in social media and all that good stuff? Well, ooh, um on social media ooh, I'm, I'm i'm scarce on social media even though i'm all I'm, all I'm on snapchat i'm on periscope i'm on facebook i'm on ig but i'm mostly on periscope if you want to find me you can find me on periscope at running for zion that's r-u-n-n-i-n the number four and z-i-o-n um and that's also my email address too at gmail.com all right Brother Melvin, uh, tell us how we can get you as well as tell us about your wonderful show. Thank you, Brother Kente and Dr. Vibe and all the brothers we have. Hey, listen, brothers, it's been great being here with you guys. Yes, you yes, guys yes. can contact me at www.dyingonmyfeet.com. Also, if you're not busy, most Friday nights at 7 p.m., we have a video cast called the Nobody Asked Me Guy Show. And uh, we have quite a few guests that we like to talk to. Actually, tomorrow night, we have, uh, uh, most of us have made with Black Wall Street and all of that. Uh, we, we'll be talking with the Overton family, uh, who are descendants uh, of those bankers. And the bankers, there's a movie called The Banker. It's going to be their descendants. Uh, so we'll be talking tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Feel free to join us. And uh, I want to make sure I stay in contact uh, with you, brothers, because I have learned a great deal. And, and as I say to Dr. Vibe and Dr. Kente, when I get to talk to them, is that I enjoy listening to other people because I learn a lot yeah, yeah. you're sharing and getting information. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I am a doctor like Dr. Dre's a doctor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Francis, uh, how, how can we get you in social media and, and, and uh, um, is there anything we need to be on the lookout for with you? Um, no, just uh, you can look for me on my um, church website. Um, www.deltabayclc.org um, and then you can look at our, our we have a, a Facebook page uh, but you can always email me directly um, at lfran512 at yahoo.com that is lfran512 at yahoo.com if you want to uh, stay in contact with me and uh, where, where are you based out of? I am right now in Antioch, California. Oh, okay. I'm in Los so, Angeles. Yeah, so yeah, we're, we're we're a suburb of Oakland. We're we're all mm-hmm. gentrified. You know, after the cities are being gentrified, all of us now have relocated to Antioch. So Antioch is what to Oakland, what Ferguson is to St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm. um, yeah, come, come come check us out in Antioch. Uh, it's uh, you know, it's 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 an interesting city. Uh, we have urban problems without a lot of urban resources. That's another show. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm also right now currently the assistant principal of Liberty High School in Brentwood, California. Uh, go Lions. Uh, this is why I'm coming straight from work. I'm coming from a black educators meeting. So this is why I'm in a suit. I would have I would have dressed down. Um, but I'm, I'm literally coming straight from work. But I enjoy all of you brothers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vibe. All of you brothers. It was iron sharpening iron. Uh, tonight and I got about uh, three months of sermons just by from listening. So, right. <laughs> it was, it was right. wonderful meeting you. <laughs> just yeah. listen. All I need is a word. That's it. 
It was wonderful <laughs> meeting you, brother. Definitely. And Brother Crawley, uh, once again, how can we get in contact with you? And tell everybody about your great show. And shout out to Ronald. Uh, who's uh, He's a great host. And I'd love to hear him uh, and you guys, uh, you know, uh, chop it up. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you, Kente, for the invitation. And brothers, when I say it's a pleasure being up here with all you all, you all were dropping nuggets that's well needed, man, from... I mean, everyone. So, I mean, I just hate that it's ending and I'm looking forward to the next time <laughs> because y'all have been great, man. And, and some notes and stuff that I've been trying to get the church to see over the last, last nine years, you all were touching on some things. So thank y'all so much for letting me be a part. Uh, yeah, Critical Dialogue is a show that we have. It comes on every Tuesday. Uh, we here on the East Coast in North Carolina. Well, I'm in North Carolina. Ron is in Virginia, uh, but it comes on every uh, Tuesday night. Uh, Eastern time, it comes on at 8.30. So that's what, three hours? So it's 5.30 y'all time, I think, uh, or in the West mm -hmm. time. Yeah, mm -hmm. on, and it's a social, uh, it's a Facebook Live uh, where you can find me on Facebook or you can actually find me in my brand new book. Yes. <laughs> yes. The New Age Vernacular. And if you can see the website, is and you see my name, uh, you can actually reach me on andrewcrawlyministries.com um, where we can do our seminars and stuff like that and we travel and doing things like that. But, you know, it's important because what y'all were hitting on, I actually wrote chapters about and y'all didn't even know about it. The chapter, I have a chapter in here talking about there's neither Greek, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's a whole chapter in there on, on that as well. So it's a very, very book that a lot of leaders are reading and getting enlightened from. Uh, and again, the enemy uh, really wants to merge this, the mindset of the sacred and the profane. And the way he do that is by merging their language. And the way he do that is by coming up with a language that everybody think is Christian language. But when we study the scriptures, it is not. That's what that book is about. Yeah. Um, so I asked the question, how Christian is your Christian language? Uh, but yeah, again, you can you can get in contact with me, Andrew Crawley, on Facebook. Uh, we on Twitter. Um, and yeah, andrewcrawleyjr.com or andrewcrawleyministries.com. So thank you so much again, man. And I would like to get in contact with y'all brothers here, man. Maybe y'all, maybe yeah. we can have y'all even on our show and uh, and stuff like that. But even just to connect, man, with some things, other yeah. things in ministry, and just to talk again because, like I said, I'm gonna miss this when it goes off. And y'all are some sharp brothers, and thank y'all once again. Thank you. God bless you, brother. And I, you I was gonna say that like everybody should do everybody's show because um, yeah. uh, you know you guys are awesome. So. Um, Dr. Vibe, how can we get you in social media? What's uh, the next thing can we expect from you, Dr. Vibe? Well, uh, the next thing you'll expect from me, um, well, this Friday, uh, I'm doing a, a great, another great conversation, another epic conversation. Yeah, gentlemen, about what? It's about nine years ago almost now, there was a movie released called Dark Girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You remember it? Oh, talking about uh, pigmentation, colorization, yes. etc., and was produced by Bill Duke and D. Chanson Bailey. Yeah. Barry, sorry, Barry. And actually, it premiered where I live in Toronto, the Toronto International Film Festival, and I had a chance to hang out with both of them for two days. Well, Dark Girls 2 is coming up. D. Chanson Barry is producing it, and he's coming up on the Dr. Vibe show this Thursday. Great. Uh, also, Great. within the next 30 days, I'll have a Pretty sure I have a major announcement with uh, an organization, a, a part uh, in part, a part of that's doing a major collaboration with a major men's brand in regards to fatherhood. Hmm. Nice. And uh, another conversation coming up later on this month, uh, next week, have uh, Kenneth Braswell of the F uh, Fathers Incorporated talking about his initiative, Black Dad, oh, Black Dad Votes or Black Dads Count, and it's an to get 2,000 African American men to register to vote. Nice. That's nice. coming up, and I'm going to step back with Dr. Francis. Because he has to come back on. It's been too long. But other than that, uh, just just serving, really and truly just serving. Uh, next, the best place to get a hold of me is on my website, the D R V I B E S H O W dot com. And I think I'm going to probably do an Instagram live sharing my experiences. Last week I was in. Uh, the Northwest Territories in Northern Canada, getting immersed in Indigenous culture nice. and learning about fatherhood. And I think another, two, actually another thing too, black churches, we have to respect our elders. Amen. I really learned that a lot from the Indigenous culture. And the other thing I would like to say, black churches, black churches make room for others. Mm. 
Yeah. Love makes room for others. Jesus made room for others. Black churches make room for others. So, so important. Yes. I'll leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get me at Kente F on Twitter, Kente Ferguson on Instagram, and the website is IndieRadio.org. That's I-N-D-Y Radio.org. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, we'll be joined by Dwayne uh, Hendricks. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Wayne Williams uh, Atlanta Child Murders uh, update, uh, what's going on with that. And um, he's an advocate for Wayne Williams. Um, also, we're going to be talking about Kobe Bryant. Um, death as well uh in another way that uh may surprise you guys i won't say it i'll let you guys find out and um and um we will be back uh of course next week with an all-new episode of men and women talk the mars venus show not sure what that topic is going to be but it's going to be 30 minutes early five thirty. um it'll be just like last week we'll lead into it and um uh and then of course we're going to have the ladies back uh the, the ladies on and then the uh, Mars Venus the following week, I know is going to be the 15 top black movies of all time. So that should be yeah. very interesting as well. So um, with all that said, uh, I will be in our get vocal room for a little bit to chop it up. We have a whole chat room full of people in there. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank everybody. This is amazing. Uh, we have to do it again. Uh, and, uh, you know, God bless. So with that, I, I think Kinte, before you leave, I think maybe I think we also have to do part two of our Kobe Bryant discussion because I think there's a lot of a lot of people missed out on that right. on part of it, and maybe what uh, I think yeah we need to do a part two of that one. Just a suggestion. I think I made a lot of people call, call, call me up for that one, Doc. I, I think I made a lot oh, of people upset. <laughs> a lot of people uh, were mad at call me call after that one. Call, call me up with that one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I was shocked that Susan Rice didn't uh, didn't hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh.